Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to introduce to you the next keynote speaker. It's Marco Jacobs from the company Viantis. Marco studied computer science at the Technical University of Delft. And then he has worked for several companies in the computer architecture market, uh, for Bobs, for Silicon Hive, for ARC. And now he is with Viantis. And Viantis is a company, and we are proud of that which is a spin-off of the Leibniz University of Hannover and since several years successful in the market and I'm looking forward to hear more about your technology, Marco. Thank you. Yes, I wanted to first start quickly with uh, thanking Professor Blume and John Glasner. I've never been here. And this is a very different conference for me. Uh, three things that were different for me. One is I could leave my suit uh, at home, which, is, uh, which uh, was great. Then the second thing is Samos is, of course, a very nice area here. Usually I'm going to places like San Jose and Silicon Valley, and San Jose is, I think, not the prettiest town in the world. Um, and uh, it's in Europe, so it was a quick flight. No, uh, I didn't have to adjust to any time differences. I'm sure some of you did here. Uh, that's always tough. So. Great, uh, great to be here, and thanks again for inviting me. Another thing that's a little different is typically I don't connect to the uh, academic community that much. I'm always talking to people who build chips and sell chips and are looking for solutions to make their chips um, lower power, more performance, and a smaller area. It's always about PPA, power performance area. We saw that in a lot of presentations, but okay. Let me try to fly uh, through my slides. Um, and my title is marketing, actually, so I still consider myself an engineer, but uh, on my business card it says marketing, so hopefully uh, uh, I can connect to a very technical audience here. But let me, let me give you a quick background. I was just thinking, oh, why am I here? What is my background? Since I'm not in academia, if you look at, if you look at my papers, you'll find very few of them. Um, but I started in Delft. I was also at uh, University of North Carolina. I actually worked on computer graphics, and then after that, um, after my studies, I went, oh, I went to a company called Box, which was an IBM spin-off. And there, this is in 97, um, there I started working on processor architecture. Uh, so we had this processor, it was already multi-core, very advanced, very ahead of its time, I would say. Multi-core architecture, five issue VLIW, uh, this is almost 20 years ago, right? Um, and the VLIW was an indirect VLIW, which means the instructions were stored in a separate memory and you would just point to these instructions from the instruction stream. So this was in red, here you see the things that were different from a more standard uh, approach. 64-bit SIMD and another key thing that was different was the, was the single cycle interconnect between the, uh, between the processors. And the focus was anything DSP, so we did wireless, multimedia, uh, audio, voice, anything. And then I went to, uh, I moved back to, uh, to the Netherlands and I started at a company called Silicon Hive, very exciting, also again, processor IP, a very, very wide VLIW, um, 20 plus issues, uh, issue slots, uh, over a thousand bit wide, uh, Cindy, and it had, uh, the things that were new was uh, also very many loosely coupled uh, uh, register files, so not just a centralized multi-port register file. It was also configurable, I mean, one high level uh, uh, description of the whole processor, and the compiler was also very interested. Instead of using a heuristics-based compiler, it was a constraint-solving compiler. So this means you could actually find good schedules on, on these very wide VLIW um, processors. If you use heuristics, you won't find a good schedule. Um, but again, DSP, not a huge amount of focus, although I changed the company into focusing on imaging, and that led to the uh, uh, Intel acquisition. So if you have a laptop, your camera uh, will most likely uh, run through this Intel uh, 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 architecture. And then I went to a company called, uh, called ARC, which uh, later was acquired by Synopsys, again working on a multiprocessor, again an indirect uh, kind of approach, uh, SIMD, and there the big thing was it was configurable. Um, then I went to, a, a, I thought, hey, these, all these parallel architectures are difficult to program, let me go work for a tools company. So Factor Fabrics is a company that's still around that does, uh, makes it much easier to, uh, to program these, uh, these architectures. And then two years ago, I saw another uh, company, I thought, hey, um, Processor IP is really what I've been doing. That's where I can use my knowledge to help the company go to the next uh, level of growth. 
And uh, uh, the interesting thing is I asked, so what are your secret tricks? Because it's a very small, very efficient architecture. Um, and of course we have some secret tricks. But um, one thing that was really different, I think, from, from the other companies I worked for is that there was an extremely clear focus on one application. I mean, so video coding and computer vision, and otherwise it's a PLW multi-core architecture with, with two different kinds of processors, but I'll, I'll talk a bit about that uh, uh, in a little bit also. So that's kind of give you a glimpse of where I'm coming from. Um, now let's look at the market, and especially, I call it kind of anything visual, visual computing. Um, this is a picture of the Pope introduction. I don't know if you guys have seen it, or inauguration of the Pope. Uh, top, what, what did it look like in 2005? And the bottom, what did it look like in 2013? So you see cameras, suddenly everybody was carrying a camera in their pocket all day. Everybody wanted to show to their friends that they were there. And a uh, big difference, cameras are, are everywhere these days. I'm sure there's also, you know, over, uh, what is it, close to 200 cameras in this room probably, in the laptops or tablets, and of course two cameras in your phone. So cameras are everywhere, and that's also shown in, uh, um, internet traffic, so internet traffic, video on uh, standard internet is 64% uh, of the whole internet traffic. I thought it was spam, but apparently it's, uh, it's video. Um, and even in mobile now also, uh, more than half of the mobile traffic is already video. Of course this is because video is always very data intensive, high bandwidth. Um, and this is a great, by the way, I don't know if you guys, if you want to follow internet trends, Mary Meeker has a yearly report that's great, that shows uh, lots of uh, trends. And then, um, another thing I thought of is, uh, uh, well, I wanted to give you some trends on, on, uh, on visual computing. I thought, okay, what's happening on the display side? And there you see, uh, in 95, it was about the DVD, standard definition. In uh, about 2005, Blu-ray came and HDTV came, and that's about six times the number of pixels. And now, slowly, 4K is coming, which is four times the number of pixels and twice the frame rate. So you see kind of in, in the, on the display side, there's a trend of uh, every 10 years, 6X and 8X. And um, then I looked at cameras. I thought what's happening on the camera side. And interestingly enough, um, I fudged the number maybe a little bit, but I looked mm -hmm. for specific things. But I think this, these were, uh, so the image sensor, uh, Camera in '95 was VGA, Apple QuickTake, um, not a successful product. But uh, then this was a phone, the Nokia N90. I think lots of people bought it. So there was two megapixels, and then Samsung S6 this year, 16. So interestingly, the same kind of uh, scaling on the pixel side. Um, but if you look at processing. Uh, of course, everybody knows the Intel uh, products. There you see, you know, going from uh, from uh, 0.35 to 65 micron. That's a 25x difference. And again, from 65 to 14 is about to 25x. So here you see that actually processors or um, gates scale uh, much faster than pixels, and this means you have much more computational capability per pixel. And this open up, opens up a whole new opportunity. Instead of just capturing images right off of the image sensor and not doing a lot of processing, you can do more and more and more processing. So um, more and more processing available per pixel. And what are the typical things you can do then is, um, you know, of course, all these effects. Everybody knows Instagram, so they're being integrated into your phone. Uh, a nice uh, background deblurring. Uh, this is an effect I like a lot, tilt shift. Um, starts looking like a cartoon or a small a miniature model. Of course, uh, uh, HDR could be noise. Lots of lots of new algorithm noise reduction. Lots of new algorithms to make the pictures look nicer. Um, but the more interesting, there's also other things that other uh, areas that I think are even more interesting. Quite a few companies working on cameras with a 360 view. Uh, or maybe even uh, completely, uh, not just 360, but also in the, in the, in the Y direction also, 360 view, completely, uh, um, complete view, and also Google in their last keynote also showed, uh, showed this camera array of, uh, of GoPros. And uh, actually in YouTube, you could look it up, there's already the capability to do that. Uh, YouTube already supports these uh, 360 view uh, cameras. 
Um, so, but of course you need lots of processing for that. Another interesting area is um, camera arrays, and I think it's still a little bit early in phones. We've seen, I think, HTC had a phone with, uh, with two cameras, um, each with a different focal length, and then combining pictures. Um, there's several companies, this is a little bit hard to see, this a new uh, startup called Light, uh, but they have many cameras on the back of the phone. There's a company called Pelican Imaging with a camera array, um, other camera arrays. So this whole model of just a single lens with a single image sensor is changing because you can do all this computation. Um, cameras are really starting to look uh, very different. Um, and another interesting project is from uh, Rambus. They actually uh, remove the lens completely. Um, what they do is they have this, this grating of this or this uh, filter right on top of the image sensor, and um, you get a, an image that's pretty uh, uh, useless, or I guess that's kind of coded on the image sensor. But then you can compute back what you're seeing, and this means you get rid of the lens, get rid of half the cost of, an, of a camera module. Uh, it's maybe still a little bit blurry, but this really reduces cost, so you can think of these uh, uh, you know, as uh, IoT, very small, sub one dollar cameras going into your car for backup or maybe just your interface, so it's uh, interesting. Um, another big trend is 3D cameras. Um, they use time of flight, so actually measuring how long does it take for photons to return. Uh, structured light, which, is, uh, which projects an infrared. Um, structure and based on how these how this grid changes you get the 3d information of course stereo cameras used in automotive uh, another algorithm that i'll talk a little bit about is structure for motion that's getting 3d information from a standard single camera um, so um, that's that's all uh, about some uh, interesting trends and, and one key trend is also to use image sensors cameras for machine vision so instead of just capturing and storing and distributing um, the real world. Uh, we want machines to understand what they're seeing and then act upon it. So that's machine vision or computer vision. Um, I missed the talk on Sunday, but I think there was already uh, uh, some discussion on, uh, on driverless vehicles or autonomous vehicles. I think this is a very hot uh, area we're heavily involved in. So um, today, of course, uh, we have to hold the steering wheel and we have to control the, the gas and the brake. Um, but hopefully in 2020 our cars will become robots and we just get in and these robots will take us places where we want to go. That's how I think of the car. Um, and um, of course there's many advantages of that. One is it's really a lifesaver. World Health Organization says 1.2 million people die on the roads. It's very, it's, you know, it's, I consider it a very big war. Uh, out there every year over a million people die um, of course it can also really save a lot of time if you can work in the car um, in the US over the lifetime of the people most people have quite a bit of a commute therefore five years of their lives if you add up all the numbers one hour to work one hour back it adds up to about five years of their lives that they're spending inside the cars so it can be a huge time saver if you can do um, real work, work or relax while you're in the car and cost saver, this is also interesting, I think, uh, on insurance, insurance is very high. If I calculated it per mile, you're paying actually 10 cents. Everybody in the U.S. pays $100, $200 a month per car, roughly, on insurance. You going? <laughs> it's higher. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, well, maybe it's, maybe it's higher, but, um, yeah, so it's, uh, it's quite a big uh, cost. Yeah, people drive 20,000 miles and they pay 2,000. Um, Two thousand uh, dollars per year in insurance. It's actually ten cents. So this is close to getting what you pay for for gas. I guess it's pretty terrible, but every, nobody thinks about it. But hopefully, this insurance will go away when our cars are hundred percent safe, no accidents anymore, no need for insurance. You just get it uh, when you buy the car. Sorry. Yep. Well, no name. Yes. So I'm hoping that it will be the car manufacturer, just like when I'm buying a, a laptop. You know, I, uh, it, it's not going to explode on the if it explodes. Somebody will give a, an Apple, uh, Apple call. Um, 
I'm hoping insurance will go away. But a lot of people say, oh no, the insurance companies will just see this as uh, another opportunity to milk. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but, but the interesting thing is, insurance is a trillion dollar, worldwide trillion dollar business. Right? In the US alone, it's like, uh, I think it's uh, like 500 billion, 300 million people in the US times 2,000 a year. It's a lot of money. But, um, and also road capacity will increase a lot. Um, so you can, if all these cars can drive closer to each other and they're more steady in driving, actually when there's, there's a report that says if 90% of the cars are autonomous, it will actually double the road capacity. So that also um, can half your travel time to, uh, to work, um, for instance, if you're sitting in traffic a lot. Uh, but uh, the only autonomous vehicle today, I think, is the elevator, right? I get in, I press a button, and it takes me where I want to go. So there's not many, uh, people have been trying this for some time, even in trains. There's some, some out there, so it's, it's a tough problem. It's a very tough problem. Um, and uh, I don't know if you, you guys know this a little bit about marketing, but uh, there's this, uh, this hype, hype cycle. People call it the, the hype curve. And you could say, I think, in, in, uh, in driverless cars, you know, Google, and a lot of people are hyping it. I would say we're right uh, kind of here. There's no early adoption yet. You can't really buy a car yet, but uh, so we're probably here. So quite a bit of hype. Everybody wants a, a driverless car. Everybody says, when, when is it going to get to the market? So at some point, people are going to get a little bit disappointed, and then real products come on the market, and then it will become uh, you know, slowly a uh, commodity. So it'll, it'll be interesting still going through this hype cycle, but it's certainly real, right? We're saving lives, saving time, saving costs. Um, but, uh, but the thing is, uh, um, it's going to be a big leap from a current car to a fully driverless car. There's legislation, lots of R&D, you need very good maps, maybe vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication. But we know two key, two key components will be image sensors and lots of image processing in the car. Many cameras and uh, even more image processing. So, uh, and another thing is that the change will be gradual. It's not that suddenly tomorrow somebody will announce, we're all waiting, somebody will announce, you know, Tesla or whoever it is, Volkswagen or Toyota will announce a car and it will fully be autonomous. That's not the way it is. If you talk to the car manufacturers, they're thinking, what am I going to add to my car next year? And it's going to be a few cameras, it's going to be rear view, maybe some cameras looking uh, in front of you, in front of the road, or maybe cameras looking at you, are you still awake? Because a lot of accidents are because people aren't paying attention, you have your eyes on the road. So they're, they're thinking, what, what should I introduce next year, next year, next year? So there'll be a gradual change. It won't be just a step, step change. So um, um, I'm not sure how am I doing on time. OK. Um, so these are the kind, of th the kind of things that are really happening in the automotive industry. Uh, rear view will be standard in, in the US. Every camera, every new car will have a rear view camera, uh, standard. So that's a big, uh, big market. Then there's surround cameras that look around you and your car. They reproject these images to get the top view of the car. So it's, if you're playing a racing game, you see your own car from the top and you see it all around. This is already in, uh, in production, right? Uh, um, but that adds uh, uh, four cameras. Then there's actually mirror replacement. So the mirrors consume a few percent of the gas. So you want to, because they stick out, um, so you actually want to get rid of the mirrors, put a small camera in the back and get a nice display in your dashboard that gives you a big view of uh, what's going uh, to the left and the right and behind you, what's, uh, what's going on. Driver monitoring, I've talked about that. And then the big complex one is the front camera. Uh, so usually they have two cameras at least. Or some people use three cameras with different, uh, different focal lengths. And this really does a, a lot of analytics. So you want to find out where's the road, are there people in front of me, are there vehicles in front of me. Um, you want to read the traffic signs. Um, you want to dim the headlights, so you want to have a, a big headlight when there's no other cars around. You want to shrink the headlight um, when there's someone coming towards you. Um, so that's all about automotive. But what else is going on is uh, 
in mobile, there's quite a bit of uh, action too. Uh, Google Tango project uh, earlier, uh, Luna also showed it. A uh, very interesting project, uh, I think. So they're um, capturing the world in 3D using uh, uh, new image sensors, uh, maybe for augmented reality, also for positioning. So right now your phone doesn't know exactly where you are. It just knows you're you know, based in Samos within 10, 10 meters, but you want it to use indoors positioning and you can actually use the camera to do very um, accurate indoor uh, positioning. Mm -hmm. Another success is to connect. I don't know how many of you guys are gaming. I don't, I'm not a big gamer. I don't like gaming. But apparently this is a um, uh, this is a 3D sensor also and it has been integrated or shipped over a million units. This is an example of a current product that uses a lot of computer vision that is involved in production and did well. Um, oh, Recently, Google Photos that allows you to search through images. Um, so I just typed in beaches in, in my photos, and it shows uh, this is a lake. It's not a beach, but it looks like a beach, I guess. You see here, I'm, I'm, I wasn't in Samos. You see, uh, my uh, my youngest is wearing a hat. This is how, how I go to the beach in the Netherlands. You have to wear a uh, warm hat and put your winter coat on. And, uh, um, but anyway, so so Google Photos is interesting. You can search for any term. And it'll return you uh, photos. It'll return photos to you um, of the search engine. So it's a visual search, and this can be expanded upon, and then, uh, maybe it'll become live in your camera automatically. If you take a picture here, it'll tell you who it is. Or, um, very interesting. Uh, then another uh, success is uh, the fingerprint sensor. I don't consider it really an, an image sensor, but it is. It reads your fingerprint, and then analyzes. Is it you who's accessing the phone or not? And of course, this is uh, this is right. It's doing well. It's a commodity now, I would say. Um, dash cams. So these these cameras also become always on. Dash cams, of course. Google Glass. Uh, cameras are becoming rugged. So the GoPros, of course, very popular. Interesting. There's some camera pills. Um, I haven't heard of them a lot, but small pill with a camera with a wireless interface. You can swallow it and take pictures of the inside of your body. Um, drones, uh, also lots of cameras there. Right now, mostly to capture images, but they'll also more often become smart. So maybe to follow you. Um, yesterday, we were on the boat. Hopefully, a few years from now, somebody will bring a drone and throw it in the air and just tell, take a picture of everyone. You know, at the end of the day, I want to have everyone's face. Um, on this picture and the drone will just fly around us, hopefully not be too noisy and just take pictures of everyone. Um, that's uh, that's coming too, people that are following you, uh, uh, drones following you while you're skiing, these are becoming more autonomous. But um, So lots of ideas, um, but there's also been in computer vision quite a few failures. So uh, Android's face unlock, too slow, not, um, not robust enough. I would consider it a failure. Samsung introduced gesture interfaces on your phone so that you can, instead of having to touch it to swipe, you can just go like that. Who, who cares, right? It didn't work as well. So I think I consider it a big failure. But uh, Amazon had a couple of interesting things. They had this eye tracking while you're watching, looking at the phone. Also didn't work very well. They were changing the user interface so it looked more 3D. Failure. Uh, Camera-based search app not taking off Google goggles. I don't know who remembers that. Google Glass. I've also considered it failed. So machine vision is still looking for opportunities. Where does it work? Is it robust enough? And automotive definitely is the case. In mobile, yeah, there have been quite some uh, quite some failures. It's going to happen, but uh, you need to look for exactly where the technology works robustly enough, fast enough. Um, and then I just. Uh, I um, wanted to show you something else, which is a high-level trend, is image sensors, so cameras are actually outgrowing already for many years. This doesn't show the trend, this just shows really what kind of uh, applications the, the cameras are going into, but image sensors are outgrowing the semiconductor industry by about a factor of two for many years now. So this just shows that it's a very interesting area, imaging, to, uh, to operate in. So 8 to 10 percent uh, compound annual growth. So they're growing, growing, growing. So the importance of cameras to the whole semiconductor industry is, uh, is growing because it's an extremely powerful sensor. Um, so let's look at what what does this visual processing actually uh, look like. Let's quickly look at a 
a couple of algorithms. One algorithm is uh, to do uh, feature detection. Um, because be before we start designing a processor, let's look at what do we actually want to run on this processor. Right? Um, one thing, just to give you an idea of what kind of processing is involved, I'm going to show you a few of these algorithms from a very high level. But this is a, a feature detection. And a feature is typically a, a corner in the image um, that you can track then from frame to frame. So lines are hard to track because the line, you know, you know you're somewhere across the line, but if you know you're in a corner, uh, let's say if you track this corner here, then you know if my camera is moving and you track this corner, you have this, this exact location over there, you know exactly where you are. So that's why feature detection is used a lot. Um, the way it works is you first find these uh, horizontal uh, edges here, you find vertical edges, and then um, you look at the gradient, and when uh, you look at the eigenvalue uh, of this 2 by 2 um, matrix, and wherever you have a gradient in two directions, so a clear gradient into one direction and a clear gradient into the other direction, you say you have found a corner. Um, of course, per pixel, this thing will show up multiple times, so you have to do the dilation and then select. Um, <coughs> So this is a typical feature detection. So every pixel you need to touch, you need to find these gradients, you have to do filter to do edges. Um, fairly simple, but quite some uh, computations per pixel. Of course you want to do this at 60 frames per second, maybe 2 megapixel uh, resolution. Um, but that's a feature detector, especially used for tracking from, uh, from frame to frame where things are going. Um, then this is a... a uh, hog algorithm. This is uh, for pedestrian detection. And now it's getting a little bit more complex. So this is about detecting objects in the scene. So is there a pedestrian in my view here or not? So should I step on the brake uh, or not? Or give a warning or not in a car? Um, operates on Luma only. So uh, no color, just grayscale. First thing you do is, uh, and a lot of these object detectors do this, is to just resample your image at different scales. So you start off with the original resolution, you scale it maybe by 10, 15%, and you run the same algorithm on that smaller scale, smaller, smaller, smaller scale. So you already immediately expand your search space. It's quite, quite a dumb algorithm, but that's the way most of these algorithms uh, work. Very brute force. Um, so you generate this multi-scale image pyramid, you do some normalization, then Actually, what you do is you slide, you take a window that is um, here, that typically use uh, 64 by uh, 128 pixels window, and you start sliding it across, sliding it by a few pixels. So again, your search space gets uh, a lot bigger again. You do your whole algorithm on this small window on one of the scales, and you slide it a little bit, and you run the whole algorithm again. Then you, um, um, you actually divide this up into 8 by 8 blocks, two by two, uh, eight by eight blocks. So, um, and for each of these blocks, you do a histogram, um, and out comes uh, actually a vector of about 400 elements. So just for this small window, you get about four element vector, and then you correlate that to, a, to what they call an SVM vector, so a trained vector, so you multiply, and then if the, uh, the uh, the dot product is above a certain value, there's correlation with this vector that you trained, and it says yes, that is a prediction. So um, this just gives you some feel of the algorithms. Uh, this is a hog SVM, so quite a bit of processing. Um, this is from 2005. Um, and uh, uh, another thing I wanted to uh, show is this structure from motion algorithm. So how do we perceive 3D? Everybody thinks we use two eyes to perceive 3D, but there's actually about 10 cues we use um, to perceive 3D. And, uh, but the strongest cues are this motion parallax um, and depth from motion effect. So I think of it, you know, these pirates, they, a lot of pirates apparently have one eye, but they're not bumping into things all the time, right? They can still live a pretty normal, happy pirate life. Um, so they're not using stereo vision to know how, how, uh, how far away objects are. You just use a single eye, um, and by moving a little bit, you see things that are close, move much further. 
than things that are far away. You can actually get a fairly accurate uh, depth information. And, and uh, we're working together with a company on this Viscoda, which is also um, <coughs> located at the, at, in Hanover. And um, so there you use two frames. You need multiple frames now. You track from frame to frame these feature points. Where do they go? Um, and based on where objects are moving, you can actually calculate back with quite a, a little bit complex algorithm, you can get, calculate a full 3D point cloud. And then you see 3D, it is using this 3D point cloud, you know how far away objects are. Another nice thing is that you get a very good segmentation. So if this point cloud partially is moving to the right and the rest of the point cloud is moving to the left, you know these are from two, uh, two different objects. Uh, so that's called structure for motion, and they use it for automatic parking and assist, actually. Using standard cameras, you don't need a special camera. And then an area that's, of course, uh, has had quite some press and is showing impressive results and has very fancy names uh, called deep learning or neural networks. Neural networks have been around for some time, but they're called convolutional neural networks, which are also object detectors. So you give it an image. Um, you give it many images, you tell it these are images of cats or images of faces, and you train this network. This offline process often on, uh, on GPU, very data intensive. You have to give it thousands and thousands of images. This is also how the Google Photos uh, works. Um, and um, once you've trained it, you can run it on an embedded system to do the real time object detection. So typically, uh, this is a schematic overview, but you have these multiple layers, and each layer does a lot of convolutions, so maybe five by five filters, and these filter coefficients have been trained. Um, but otherwise, it follows the same schedule as Hawk. So first, do a multi-scale image pyramid, and then instead of looking for these gradients and histograms, actually, you could say you kind of train this feature vector. So. The algorithm is very flexible and it knows automatically, since you've trained it, what, to, what kind of features uh, to look for in the image. Um, and this is now actually uh, quite advanced and some of these algorithms are now beating humans. So they have the computer, they, uh, they detect uh, objects in photos, and then they have a panel of people and they say, you know, what, what do you see in the photo here? And maybe somebody says, I see a frog in the image. But the computer actually said it's a frog of this type, or you know, it's actually beating humans at, at detecting things, which I think is very, very impressive. Um, oh, and uh, this is an interesting uh, image that looks maybe a little bit trippy, but uh, here they kind of reworked the algorithm and show of, of a picture of the sky. Uh, they kind of reprojected what this neural net looks like. And you can see, but just looking at a standard picture of the sky, I thought it maybe saw some animals here. And uh, yeah, so this doesn't have any practical use, but it's very interesting to kind of, kind of get a glimpse inside the brain of such a, a, a deep neural net. Um, oh. um, another interesting way to look at this, and why I think it's important for hardware architects to look at visual computing is if we look at ourselves, if we look at our brain, how is our brain used? So it turns out, somebody tried to uh, figure it out, and it turns out about half of our brain is used for visual processing. Uh, we consume about 100 watts. Our brain is quite a bit, or at least for, for especially in the, in the room here, I'm sure people are using quite a bit of energy, and we need all this Greek food to keep that going. Um, but uh, so the brain consumes about 20 watts, and so about 10 watts for uh, visual computing. And so quite a bit of um, uh, mobile platforms that were showing numbers of uh, today and yesterday uh, about the same wattage, right? Which is kind of interesting to me. Also, five to 10 watts are quite some slides. Um, so the challenge is really to build a machine that can beat the human. Uh, we don't have to beat it at everything. You know, I don't think we can build something that beats human at everything visual. But of course, the nice thing with machines is you just have to beat them at a, a human at single thing. For instance, if you make it faster than a human, that's useful. Or if you make it safer than a human, or make it cheaper, like in a, in a factory, if you make the machine a little bit cheaper than a human, then uh, um, 
you have a product that you can sell. So, uh, oh, um, going a little bit into the hardware now, uh, if you look at a Samsung mobile applications processor at the die, uh, very interesting to me is, if you consider this the brain, half the brain is visual computing. Actually, on the die of a Samsung um, applications processor, it's quite similar. So there's big arms here, control processing, uh, clock cluster there, the, the little one for lower power operation, and a big uh, A15 cluster here for the uh, more heavy duty processing. And then here, on the left side, um, it's pretty much all visual computing. Uh, so this is a, a shot from uh, Tech Insights, these analysts, I don't know if this is all correct, but this was their analysis. Uh, about a quarter of the die is GPU, so mostly doing graphics, but more and more often uh, also used for, uh, for camera type things, image processing. There's display, there's an ISP. ISP is the first thing that uh, when the signal comes off of the camera, makes it into a nice picture. Uh, video compression, Video decompression, so uh, actually half of the die today, very heterogeneous system, many different kinds of cores, some hardwired, some used to be hardwired, now becoming more programmable, but um, um, yeah, this is interesting to me. And if you look at kind of what the complexity is, of uh, it's another way I think of this, is uh, if you look at the complexity of the code that runs on these two halves, this is um, Android is about 30 million lines of code. People install apps, so just as a very rough measure, my guess is all of us have about 50, mile, 50 million lines of code in our pockets. That's this domain, so lots and lots of code. You need big caches, you need to be good at control processing. But where the, where the signal, where signal processing is happening, also um, code size shrinks a lot. So I don't know how much it is on the GPU, but I guess there's quite a bit of code there, but a, a video codec, for instance, video compression is maybe 50,000 to 100,000 lines of code. So much smaller. This means, and the art, and much more targeted, so this means you can uh, have very different uh, architectures. The ISP, I've done some work on ISPs. There I would say the algorithms are getting ever more complex, but I've seen ISPs of a, a few thousand lines of code, so uh, um, just another way to think of this. So then a little bit about uh, the company I work for, so we, we, uh, we do processor IP, um, we focus on, on, on two things really, one is this computer vision, and the other one is video compression, decompression, and these are our main three targets, so mobile, home, and automotive is then uh, the, the important target for us now just because there's so many requests from the industry. So we do processor IP, we license our processor to the chip, uh, to the chip guys that build then uh, the chip out of it, um, just like ARM. And uh, maybe I should go back here. Our, our, my vision for the company is that, oh. Let's, ah. For me, ARM can have the right half, and if we can have the whole left half, then we can be quite, uh, quite happy. And this is doable, I think. It'll take some time, but I would not be surprised if this gets consolidated more on an architecture that's um, just a single architecture from a, from a single company. So, what do we, I don't know how, God, how well you all know IP, but uh, if you look at a car, then uh, there's a camera module in the car, there will be a little board in there, uh, in the board will be few chips, one very important one, and then we just sit in a corner of the chip, just a few square millimeters. Right? That's, our, that's our business model. We license it, and um, that's where we sit in the car. Um, I'll go over this pretty quickly, but I just wanted to let you know a little bit uh, of the company history. So it actually started in 97 in Hanover at Leibniz University, spun out uh, with the first chip, with the first customer, the company spun out. So since then, it's been uh, uh, organically grown off of customers. We did this, uh, another chip and another chip, just prototypes. And since 2008, we're in automotive, uh, in the automotive industry, and have customers there. It's nice to be in automotive. It's a coincidence that uh, in Germany, it's quite a bit uh, happening, and we're kind of 
at the center uh, of it there geography, uh, from a geography perspective. So that's, it all uh, kind of lines up uh, for us there. Um, then, uh, the architecture that we do a lot of uh, work on, um, a few words on that. So, um, we call it the heterogeneous architecture because we have two different kinds of processors. Um, we have what we call an SP, which is more risk-like, not as wide, and it's uh, used especially for doing bit-stream <laughs> processing, so bit packing for uh, Huffman encode, Huffman decode, the final stages of, of compression, of video compression, uh, where you're not touching pixels anymore, but you're touching bits, kind of like zip. Um, so that's, we build a, a, what we call a stream processor for that, and then we can instantiate multiple of these processors um, in, in a subsystem of us. And then we have our MP cores, our media processing cores, these are the processors that touch the pixels. Um, that is a Vila W uh, engine, uh, use also Cindy, and then we have multiple cores of those. Uh, so we can do uh, full HD, uh, H.264 or 4K, H.264 encode or decode on just a few of these processors. Here's some, some performance numbers. Um, so that's the system we, uh, we license on a high level. It's actually the fourth generation already, so we're incrementally making uh, improvements and improvements. Uh, but if you compare it to the... So if you look at um, where all this visual processing happens, um, of course, the CPU is always there. Usually you have a big arm in the system or a smaller arm. Um, construction level parallelism, not that much. These are mostly superscalar. Um, and uh, they have Cindy, like Neon, multiple cores, very long pipelines, um, very big caches, not a very good target for, uh, for computer vision or uh, imaging. GPU, I think it's actually it's a little bit better target, of course, it's a very wide array it's, and uh, many cores usually, but still uh, we see quite uh, uh, it's a lot of history of 3D graphics, so not as efficient really. I know it's better than CPUs for these tasks, but still not very efficient. And then there's kind of a new class uh, of imaging these pieces, uh, there's maybe four or five companies that work on this and, and license it also. But they're doing um, also VLW, usually wider, maybe four issue slots, four plus issue slots. And I saw that this morning too, quite a few VLW architectures. But the wider you go on the issue slots, the more no ops you have, you need to do more loop unrolling to fill all those slots, um, code size increases, more no ops. <laughs> So what we actually do is we do a kind of two-issue Villa W, so not very wide, um, but it means uh, for the applications we, uh, we benchmark and we've been working on for many years, that seems to be a very good trade-off. Then Cindy is another thing that sometimes people go very wide Cindy. Um, if your algorithm allows it, of course that's very efficient because you do one instruction decode, one fetch, one instruction decode, um, and, uh, and then do all this, this very wide operations, but as soon as you have more control uh, control flow in your algorithm, then very wide SIMD won't work because you cannot fill all these, uh, these uh, lanes. Uh, Multi-core, we see our competition has, is still in single core domain. We, we scale by uh, introducing multiple cores. So we use all these three levels of parallelism, a uh, little bit of ILP, SIMD, and, uh, and multi-core. Processor frequency, uh, so the, the CPUs, of course, are very long pipelines to achieve very high clocks. The GPU also very high clocks, uh, medium, uh, medium to long pipelines. We have kind of a medium, uh, medium pipeline, not very many stages. Um, How many? Six. Yeah. That's what we see. Uh, yeah, that's good for us. Yeah. And no caches. I don't have a lot of information on it, but we think a lot of this visual processing is always very deterministic. We don't believe in caches, so actually all the data flow we schedule using DMAs. Uh, each core has its own DMA, and it is some work you have to understand the data flow in the algorithm, but then you don't have any cache misses, you don't have any extra tables, um, so uh, we, don't, we don't think uh, caches is the right solution to, uh, to imaging. 
So one result is comparing it to a, a GPU. Um, this is this hog pedestrian algorithm. This is maybe uh, so comparing it to an NVIDIA uh, GPU. <coughs> this is a, an algorithm with a lot of control flow inside because you have to do histograms, so it's maybe not one that is most easily mapped to a GPU, but um, uh, NVIDIA did it. They optimized it. They were right next uh, 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 as us right next to us on this, on this show, and they were showing it running at three and a half frames per second. Um, we were running the same algorithm, and uh, on our chip, which is 40 nanometer, much smaller than a big GPU, we were reaching about 40 frames per second, so about 10x performance. But if you look at performance per watt, uh, the GPU consumes maybe four watts, some people have said six or 10 for this particular part, so about one watt. Um, per frame, and uh, we run at about 40 milliwatts, so there's actually three orders of magnitude you can get uh, still beyond GPUs on power efficiency, uh, but just restricting, restricting your architecture, making all the right trade-offs just for uh, imaging. So this is a very good result for us, and this, we need to be at least, we need to beat GPUs by 10x, otherwise we won't be in business, because GPUs are out there, they're available, <coughs> so, uh, this, this thing. so so you optimize your, your architecture to the algorithm, did you also optimize it with the algorithm to the architecture? Yeah, no, so I would say more the, more the latter than the former. So we, so our, 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 our architecture is fixed, right? This, this is a chip here that we taped out in 2010. Mm -hmm. um, back then when we did the chip, this, this, uh, this algorithm was not on our radar screen. Um, it was just a flexible architecture to do image processing. So it's not an application-specific uh, design. We have no instructions in the instruction set, particularly for, for histograms. Or, so fully flexible still. Yeah. So uh, the results of the algorithm that is optimized, uh, how different are they from the original algorithm? Yeah, so it's a, it's a good question. I think you always have to look at the algorithm. Then there's algorithmic optimizations that you can do. Um, one is we did not change the algorithm. We changed the algorithm implementation. Yes, we of course rewrote loops or rewrote code a little bit, but it's still a bit exact to the original OpenCV implementation, or pretty close. Very close. Right. Yes. So the algorithm is exactly the same. Right. So it's not. We did not come up with a new algorithm that just does pedestrian detection and then compare it. No, that that would be very unfair comparison. But of course, you have to restructure your code. I think everybody here is very familiar with it's always, a, it's always a, 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 a choice where you, uh, how far sh could you go beyond uh, the algorithm itself and still me measure the performance based on that. Um, it, it's, it's always fair. It's the, the choice, this choice actually eventually influences also whether you will implement it in a specific application domain or not. So whether it's still useful in the application domain. Right. right. Yes. Oh, another question? Yes, yes. sure. Uh, how did you measure the power consumption in the NVIDIA data table? Reading the website. <laughs> yes, we did not do anything special. Yeah, Yeah, because NVIDIA say advised not to uh, not check the, the energy consumption or because it, the, the board itself is not optimized for energy efficiency. I mean. Yeah, so we've, we've, I've seen several presentations on this and they show different numbers. It, it is a little bit unfair because this includes, I think, the DRAM controller. For us, it does not. We measure our, our core only, but DRAM controller is usually maybe what I've seen about 30%, you know, so the, the, the DRAM of the, the overall. But the, the, the key thing is it's three orders. And these numbers, if, if there's NVIDIA presentations out there that show 6, 7, 8, 10 watt, 12 watt for this, for this architecture when it's fully uh, loaded. So things, this is not something that we measured and it's, uh, that NVIDIA shows very different numbers. And if you look at these devices that go into cars, they have heat sinks about this size, um, huge, huge power pump. Yeah. Um, okay, so yeah, getting back to it. So our core is little, just a couple of square millimeters. You can do computer vision, 4K, video coding or this computational photography. Um, you can, of course, instantiate it multiple times. Or it's a scalable architecture. You can grow it and shrink it. But that's, that's our business that we're in. Okay, so quick conclusion. Um, 
I hope I showed all these trends that shows that the visual computing field has grown very quickly. And I think if you would compare, if you could do a comparison of maybe 10 years ago, how many papers at SAMAS were about imaging? Now it was uh, maybe a third of the overall conference. I don't know, maybe a quarter, maybe quite a bit, right? So there, it's very good to see that academia is in touch with uh, with the industry. I think, uh, but uh, but uh, yeah, I see growing very quickly. Computer vision has many new applications, um, and today there's no single architecture. Very fragmented field. So of course you have CPUs and GPUs. GPUs used to be for graphics. Now a lot of people do imaging on it. Um, of course, there's opportunities to hardwire things. There's DSPs and vision processors. So really. I think the time is right now to really focus on this more. It's a very good area for us to be in, and it's uh, that's really the time is right to focus on imaging in general. I think the, the CPU domains are half of the half of the die that you saw has seen many decades of research. Uh, it's very hard to make big improvements there, but the, the left half left half of that application processor that I showed, there is still a lot of creativity. Uh, so I think it's all opportunity for the people. More. Okay. So thank you, Marco, for the presentation. You already started the discussion, <laughs> but let's go on. <laughs> Please. Dynamic vision sensor. DBS. Uh, I'm sure you know about it. Uh, Dynamic vision sensor. Do you yep. know it? Well, it's a new sensor that has come out of the new one. So uh, it's coming on the Zurich. And this kind of sensor actually sends you more event based. So when you take some cuts and you some cuts, it's only then it's a big balance and you can Okay. Only the difference. Mm -hmm. Yes. So that seems to be used by quite many people in the local community, not in this. I just thought that if you have looked at it and you want to comment on what impact it is having on architecture, but it's not sending a complete frame, it is only sending event by event. Oh, yeah, you yeah, no, I've not seen this. Um, I see the, the, the bandwidth between the image sensor yeah. and the next chip is MIPI, usually very, very uh, uh, just a few wires, many gigabytes. I, I never see this as a long bag. It's cheap. So in terms of solving bandwidth issues, I, I don't see them in the industry. No, but MIPI is... In terms of the processing, to just work on the differences. Well, object detector, you need to see the whole image, single image, and then you do an object you know, you want to know if there's a person or a face or whatever, there's a view. For optical flow is maybe a little diff different because then you look at the differences. Um, so there could be some advantages there, but yeah. Can you benchmark on this trying media? Because that's the GPUs are yeah, so I know Trimedia quite well. Uh, very interesting processor, but not, not available in the market anymore. So we have not looked at that. Yeah, we look at our competition and then benchmark against processors that are on the market today. Yeah. So it's a nice assist for me for, for run compared to back to you. Uh, again, because I think you saw, uh, showed a slide about the Google Cargo project. Yes, yes. yes. And, that, and as I know, that uh, this, uh, this mobile phone includes Movidus uh, okay, processor. Yes. Okay. Uh, okay. And also, I think uh, the role of Movidus is to accelerate the graphics and all this stuff, visual stuff. It's a, it's a yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Just to understand, I mean, okay. Also, this, this processor is a work with you. Uh, it's good for stream up, streaming application, as in your case. But I think uh, uh, the artist, let's say, optimizes everything mainly for automotive industry. Is that, uh, or not, or let's say, in your, uh, in your process, can, let's say, mobile phone? Yeah. yeah. No, so we focus on, on video codecs. So I didn't talk a lot about video codecs, but we do yes, very to, 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 to Yeah, and then. The rest, I would call, we call it vision, but it's really imaging. So we don't focus on very narrow things. Uh, automotive is a very hot market, so that's why we focus on automotive because there the need uh, is most there. People are dying, and, and you know cars um, are quite expensive. So it's a there is a lot of it's a big market. 
really. Um, so we, but uh, there's one thing about automotive that is very different, and we're, we're doing special things for automotive, which is safety. So this means if a bit, and that this ties into the presentation from yesterday, it was interesting, the bits fall over. If a bit falls over and your car steers off the road, that's not a good thing, right? If a bit falls over and your mobile phone crashes and you need to reboot it, that's not bad. But in a car, immediately, that's the end of your life. So there, it means in an automotive, there's a lot of process, process that you need to adhere to. Uh, so this means while you're developing, you need to show how you're uh, you know, track bugs, showing, uh, for instance, uh, traceability, and a lot of documentation to ensure you follow these automotive safety processes. But also on the hardware side, things like ECC, uh, building in redundancy, um, so we have that, and that's for safety, for, for robustness, purely robustness. Um, we, we do something. It's a small technical question. What uh, DMA? Okay, uh, your your uh, <coughs> the lack of cases use DMA. So I think can you consider DMA as scratchpad memory in your you know scratchpad memory? Yeah. Okay, can you say that uh, your DMA plays a similar role, let's say, in, in your uh, design? If, yeah, yeah, you could say that. Software control cast. Yes, exactly. exactly. Yes. Just make. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, so you, you have a scratch pad? <coughs> yeah, so often, so we have each. I did not show a lot of. So it's not technical, but it's a scratch pad memory is part of the. It's like registers. Okay. It's not part of the map memory space. Right. You have scratch pad registers? Are you having a scratch pad in here? Um, so we have, let me give you a little bit longer. So we have four places where we store things. One is register file, right? Standard register file. How many? Second. How many? One. One. 64 by 64. One register. No, register file. 64 by 64 bits. 64 by 64 bits. 64, by 64 entries by 64 oh, bits. Okay. Yeah. And then we have an important. That's, that's the smallest memory, right? That's what I'm not hearing you. You're dropping your voice just the moment we give you an okay. important word. My students do that to me all the time. <laughs> they don't want me to understand. I just want to understand. So, you've got 64, 64 bit registers. Correct. Next step? Local memory, SRAM. So a few kilobytes of local memory. Where we can and local system. memory is a scratch pad, or local <coughs> memory is part of the map memory space? Uh, no, not not the same memory space. Because this is just so one. it is a scratch pad. Yeah, with one memory. Which you treat like the way you treat registers, in the sense that other cores know nothing about it. Correct. It's all local. Yes. Okay, so you have a scratch pad. And how big is it? Yeah. You just told me. Eight, eight to eight to twelve. Kilobytes, still very small. That's, yeah. And then the next level, that's where we call uh, another. Usually we have another SRAM on chip that is multi-banked, multi-ported. That then all these processors hook up to, so that lives somewhere on the SOC. That's typically um, 256 kilobytes to a few megabytes. No cache. Still under control of the programmer, and only the DMAs see this address space. So if we have a load instruction in the processor, it uh, it only sees the first level, so it's eight kilobytes or ten or twelve kilobytes of SRAM. And then we have a, what we call an SRAM on a die, and then the next level is then DRAM. So yeah, and also the DRAM is only visible to the DMAs. <laughs> well, um, just a thought, uh, the domain of visual processing is also medical imaging, uh, MRI imaging, etc. Right. And um, it, it has computationally, computationally intensive kernels, uh, for example, the construction is very intensive. Uh, is there any clue about it? Uh, is there some architectures or something? Yes, yeah, so I think very interesting field, but for us, our number one question is on, because it's optimized for ASIC implementations, SOC implementations, yes. all RTL. We do not optimize for FPGAs. So our number one question is, what is your volume going to be? And since a tape out, a mask in an advanced process is, you know, <coughs> is like $2 million, or it will be all $2 million. 
the volume needs to be at least millions of units yeah. for it to make sense. Probably tens of millions of units in order to build a chip. And uh, for medical, there's not, you know, that can be, if, if everybody has to have some medical device on them, that will have the volume there. So maybe the pills, or at some point it will come. Medical is, of course, extremely important. If it's about machines sitting at hospitals, the volume worldwide is not there. So I think this will be clearly FPGA domain. X86, FPGA domain. I don't know anybody who builds chips. For, unless you have really some performance need that you cannot meet with FPGAs, of course the, the money is there. Um, so maybe some people could build ASICs, but the volume is not there, which, which doesn't help. Well, yes, uh, so it's purely a business reason why we're not focusing on, on medical. It's not a technology reason. Yeah. I'm, I'm not sure if you are allowed to answer me this question. Um, <laughs> so are you using some special tools to build your processor? So like synopsis processor design yeah, or yeah. target That's or Tensilica? Very good you, question. Or are very, you just writing it in very long language? Yes. Very good question and very happy to answer. Because <laughs> this is one of the ways we differentiate. So actually what we did is we did a lot of work and all by hand, so we do not use any processor designer, no targets, no Lisa Tech or Coware. Um, so it's really built from the ground up. This means all the RTL. This is, this is a philosophy of your group. Yeah, I think they know us. Sorry, sorry, that up. I think it's But there's and there's both business reasons to that, and there's technical reasons. Technically, you know, the overhead of you generate things. Technically, it's harder. <laughs> to fit these things into an SOC. Often what I've seen, the Silicon Hive is very similar. Single, high level a description of the architecture and you generate RTL, generate the tools, generate the simulator. So um, you also have to spend a compiler for this? Or yes. I, okay, I don't, I don't have to write a sample code? No, you can. So we want to enable that path because that's if you need to squeeze on every cycle, we give you full visibility in, in it, into the instruction set. But we also have a compiler. Thank you. Uh, but that makes it, do you do floating point? No, that's also a good question. Right now we do 8, 16, 32, and some 64 bit processing, but no float. And this is actually uh, some of the algorithms we sometimes see floating point. But, and I saw quite some algorithms here, in imaging, quite a few people are doing floating point. Of course, you have the dynamic range. And this is very important. So we do spend a lot of effort on, on float versus fixed. One of the interesting things is on optical flow, um, the original algorithm in OpenCV was float. And then we actually converted it to fixed. And it, what's important to realize is precision of 32-bit fixed is higher than float, right? In fixed, you can move the precision. You can, on the fly, move the dot in your number. In you float, it's stuck, right? At 22, 23 bits, that's your position and the rest is uh, dynamic range. And this actually means sometimes in float, um, or sometimes in fixed, you can get more accurate algorithms. It's very important to know. Because we saw, you know, we do OpenCV in float, the reference code, we do our implementation in fixed, we compare it, we said large differences. Hmm, you know, we did not do our job. We did not do good conversion from float to fixed. Let's figure out where's the error. We looked at it, looked at it, looked at it, and then we said, oh, actually, ours is much more accurate than the original float. So yeah, very good. Very good. But right now, today, no float, but... So in fact, NVIDIA, for example, has discovered, and in fact, I think we've known it for a long time, that precision is not a big deal, which is to say, you can get by with a lot less precision, in fact. What NVIDIA has done, which I think is a step in the right direction, is go to a 16-bit floating point number. Yeah. So you've only got 10 bits of precision. And, you know, today, one of the sexy things in our industry is called approximate computing. Floating point is approximate computing, and it's been around for, I don't know, I was going to say centuries, but not quite. Uh, <laughs> the point is that in driving, that you don't you, you don't make a turn at thirty nine point seven three four five degrees as opposed to thirty nine point seven four five six degrees. 
approximate is usually uh, good enough. And so, uh, I don't know, maybe you're right, maybe precision is important, but um, NVIDIA at least, which is a, one of the leaders in the industry, and I think a number of us have seen that for a lot of vision related stuff, uh, less precision is better than more precision. Yes, so that, that's why we do a lot in 8-bit, 16-bit. Uh, so you... No, so you support fixed, but 8, 16, or 32, right? The real world has infinite precision on most things until you get to the atom level, I guess. But 8-bit um, is already a lot less precision than 16, so... It, float, is, to me, is about dynamic range, if, if you need the dynamic range. So that, but that's, that's correct. Yeah, but, uh, but it's true. GPUs come from a flow, 3D graphics background. With 8 bits, you don't get range. <laughs> With a 16 bit float, you get it. Correct. 10 bits of precision, 5 bits of range. Yes. So range you is. You know, Von Neumann once said that uh, only a damn fool would do float because you ought to be able to keep in your head the range. Most of us are not able to keep the range. Yeah, no, I think what I've seen following GPUs, they used to be 32 for 3D graphics. Then NVIDIA added 16 bits, maybe eight, nine years ago or so. 16 bit float representation. Now, if you look at their lightest parts, they're adding more support for integer. So that's what I'm here. Um, but yeah, sometimes you need float. Mostly you need float when you have algorithms that are what I see is matrix, matrix math. If you have big matrices and you need to invert them or something, then yeah, you need the mathematical uh, dynamic range, otherwise. But for imaging, um, we do very well with up to 64 bits fixed. So a very, very last question. <laughs> not to <laughs> skip the time scale too much. Okay, this seems not to be the case. Thank you.